back to Kiss for a minute. So in the book you alluded to also that you wrote in the book. Part of the book, you talked about um, some of your bandmates. That's a touchy subject. Um, my book was not about throwing anybody under the bus. They walked under it. Welcome to Howie Mandel Does Stuff. I'm Howie Mandel. This is... Jacqueline Schultz. This is my daughter. I know. We met. We I know, we there. met. Yeah. We've met before. Amazing. Yes. Amazing. And you are Paul Stanley. I am indeed. Yes, you are mm -hmm. uh, an icon. Well, in, thank you. In so many different fields, more than I think people, like the average person knows. Do, do you know when the first time we met? Do you remember the first time we met? It was for a TV show, wasn't it? Nope. Nope. No, I would imagine you wouldn't remember. <laughs> what, then. you want to adjust something? Yeah, so the camera here is focusing on the mic here. Okay. I'm just going to push this down uh, and then this. Oh, I, but maybe he wanted a soft <laughs> focus. Well, it, was, it was all the oh, yeah. <laughs> There we go. Good? Are we good? No one's okay, giving yes. thumbs up. Nobody's giving a thumbs up. <laughs> Do we start again? Or? No. 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 Wow, no. this is uh, this is really real. It okay. is real. Um, so uh, we met in 1982. Okay. And you were recording, um, I'm trying to remember what album it was. I met Gene and uh, he brought me to the studio and you were recording the song uh, War Machine. Ah, uh, I, you know. Did Brian Adams write that? He, ask Gene. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you were recording, yes. you, you were recording mm -hmm. uh, War Machine. Yeah, we were doing the Creatures of the Night album. Right. And, uh, yeah, I, that was a time where Gene was bringing a lot of people into the studio. Well, not only did schmoozing. he bring, he was schmoozing. He was schmoozing. He was schmoozing. And he schmoozed with me because he knew uh, Tenenbaum, who is a, a, a big, he was a big a TV producer, and his son Eric is now a big TV producer himself. And uh, Eric, me, Michael Rotenberg, and a bunch of people, we, we saw Gene out for dinner. He said, come on, we're recording this song. Mm -hmm. And then he had us, we sang. We sang on that song. Yes, you know, I, I can remember another day where he brought in, it looked like a children's choir. It was somebody's kid and that their was friends. That was us, <laughs> not us? No, you, you're <laughs> unique, but you weren't, the only, you weren't the only game in town. It seems like you weren't really welcome, Dad, by the rest of the- Wait, did you not keep the track <laughs> that we sang the background? <laughs> You better watch out, I'm a war machine. I remember the- There you go. I did, that's, <laughs> are you available for a tour? Uh, yeah, I would. I would. We sang background, and then uh, Gene said to give us a name so that he could give us a. I don't know. I've no, I haven't seen the uh, album cover in in years. But we well, were. The, you didn't see a check, that's for sure. No, <laughs> but we were the Fluffy Bunnies. We wanted a, a hard rocking mm. name to put on the back. But it was real. You, you have no idea. It, for you, it was just one of children's choirs that came in. But for me, you guys were like it. Well, thank you. Yeah, we and, made a, a an impression. You made an impression. You've made an impression your entire uh, life. Here's, uh, I'm going to go way back to the beginning because you just reminded me of something. So when, did you notice when he came in, he said, can I sit on this side? One of the most epic and iconic names in music is deaf in, on one ear, right? Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I was born with a, a microtia, which is, uh, they used to call them birth defects. That's not uh, uh, accepted anymore, but... Um, it's uh, different degrees of a crumpled uh, uh, cartilage instead of a, a formed ear. And uh, I have no ear canal, and I was born virtually without an ear. So, um, um, so hence, music. Of course. You know, <laughs> make life difficult. But that is, that, that is a kind of a dichotomy and so ironic, no? I don't know. You, I, I, I think you don't miss what you don't know. So when people say to me, well... How do you mix an album or how did you do right. this? Well, I hear it the way I've heard it my whole life. So um, I don't hear the way you do. Um, but but people seem to like it the way you hear it. it it's, uh, you know, I'm doing okay. So the problem with most people is they got sound coming in from both sides. Yes. If you want to be talented and you want to be able to create music and a sound that people are going to really respond to, plug an ear. That's, I, <laughs> That's I would lesson. recommend that. But it, it's, it's, it's interesting because um, other than the um, problems you have as a child with um, people scrutinizing or teasing. And, and Were you things, teased? Oh, it was, 
not 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 a fun time. It's it's amazing because um, children could be quite cruel and surprisingly adults too. And uh, um, yeah, well, it wasn't it wasn't fun. It wasn't easy. Um, so were you a tortured child? I don't want to say tortured. That's a horrible term. But um, I had I had it pretty tough. But there's people who've had it much tougher than me. Uh, at one point, I was speaking with um, uh, an organization in in Canada called About Face. And oh, I, you're their spokesperson. I was, yeah. yeah. And uh, I met with uh, a lot of the children, and I said, "Look, you know, um, I can't say that I've got the problems you do, or, or as as difficult as as you do. And certainly, the playing field's not not level, and it's not always fair. But you can you can succeed. And so, th just for for those that don't know, About Face is an organization where uh, if people have disfigurements and uh, mostly children, right? If they have disfigurements and that, mm -hmm. then, then this charity raises money so that they can surgically rectify some yeah, of them. Yeah, or it's also a support group, and and it's important for parents too because I don't think that a, a lot of parents know how to handle those situations. My my parents, God love them, you know, they were. You just tell people you were born that way, and just well, wait a minute. It's it's just not that simple. So, were your parents American? Or are they um, uh, immigrants? My mom, yeah, my mom was born in Berlin, and and fled and went to Amsterdam and then came to the states. And my dad was first generation here. Um, from well, his parents were from Poland, Austria, and things like that. So, um, yeah. So I, I would speak to to um, some parents and say, you know, I'm not sure that tough love is always love. You know. I, I think your kids need to be listened to and maybe you don't, you know, it, it's not a matter. They're not looking for an answer. They're looking for somebody to, to, to listen to what they have to say. And, you know, um, life's tough. It really is. Yeah. You got your ear reconstructed later in I life. I did. I did. Um, the, the technology didn't exist. That that's one of the beauties of, of, um, medical, you know, science is that it's always progressing and, and, Every, every uh, uh, surgery that can be done has developed over the years. So when I had it done, I had it done in, it was five surgeries. And it was, I started in, I was 31 years old. And they'd never worked on an adult because they were only working on kids at that point. At this time, you were already, KISS was. But KISS was, yeah, during breaks, I would go back in and for uh, a revision of another surgery. That alone, now they've got it down to one surgery, and the results are Did they build your ear out of another part of your body? <clears throat> they did. They built it out of my uh, cartilage from my rib. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, and now uh, I, now they don't even do that as, it, it's an alternative, but they use um, a, uh, a synthetic uh, uh, material called uh, Medpour. And they make these amazing ears that project out and, and match your other ear. And they do it when you're um, not much more than an infant. Do you, do you think there's any connection? Well, whose idea was it to wear makeup? It was all of ours. And, um, but you're the artist. <clears throat> you're the one is, uh, I don't, are you a trained artist? Did you study art? No, no, no. Um, I did go to the High School of Music and Art in New York for art. And I had the distinction of failing art. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, I've never been very good at, at taking um, orders or, you know, living up to other people's expectations have never been very interesting to me. So, uh, I not that I'm getting deep, though, but do you think that the idea, even if you were only a part of the mm -hmm. idea to um, be uh, behind a mask, do you think that comes from that childhood? Yeah, I think I think so. In hindsight, it's it's so interesting. First of all my makeup is asymmetrical it's only on one eye and it's on this side where is the, the ear yeah so you know i i'm not going to lay down on the the couch and and do self-analysis but um yeah it, it's really interesting um and that takes me to i start in phantom of the opera in toronto, toronto. at the Pan pantages i was the final phantom and um had to go through auditions in new york with Hal Prince's people, because the last thing they needed, they, they sure, they wanted to have a name, but they don't need Bozo to come in there and ruin a billion dollar franchise. So I did the, the um, audition and everything, and I had seen the show in the 80s, 
And much like when I saw the Beatles, there was um, an epiphany. And I suddenly went, <clears throat> I can do that. It didn't mean um, when I saw the Beatles, didn't mean I can be the Beatles, but I, I think I can touch that nerve. I don't understand why. And when I saw Phantom, I thought the same thing. And it wasn't until I did the show that I started to realize that in many ways, that character was me. Wow. You know? So you've, you actually are inspired <clears throat> and triggered by things that you see in life. You mm -hmm. chase it, and then these things actually happen. Because I also know that, uh, and maybe you don't want to talk about it, but Paul Stanley is not your real name. But right. Paul yes. is because of your inspiration. Yes. Is that not true? That is Paul McCartney, right? Paul McCartney, Paul Rogers, a great singer. Um, when I was a little kid, I said to my parents, I hate my name. What's and your first name? It was Stanley, so I decided to keep Stanley as my last name to retain some sort of connection to my past. But my parents said to me, well, you can change it when you get older. I don't think they really believed I was going to change it, but I did. Were they alive when you changed mm, it? Yes, yes. Um, Were they I, happy with that? Or? I think, you know, you know, Jewish parents, you know, have a, a certain connection to their, their past, and... Um, Look, I, I was baffling to them anyway. I was running around in tights and high heels, you know, with white makeup and putting a guitar between my legs. So to begin with, I, w I was a bit strange. But um, I, think, I think it was uh, a little hard on them. Um, I think it was a little hard on my dad. What business was he in? He was in office furniture. Very super bright guy who never really found a way to, to manifest his intelligence. He was uh, graduated high school at 16 and should have gone on to college, but his parents, um, <clears throat> pardon me, I think they, they kind of strong-armed arm, strong him into working to provide for the family. And um, I think he was frustrated through his life because uh, he was really a very, very innovative, very interesting guy. Probably 50 years ago, he came home one night and brought home Evian bottles that he had brought, you know, in some import store. And he said, this is the future of, and I went, nobody's going to buy water. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he saw that. Yeah. And he did other things just like that. And, you know, I was like, dad, you turn on the faucet, it's free. You're not going to buy bottled water. So Lo and yeah. behold. So he was, uh, but yeah, I think it, it was a, a bit difficult. Were they proud? Was that a? It was. They had to be proud because uh, having uh, being a, a, an attender mm -hmm. of a, of a Kiss concert, I can't imagine what that would feel like if that's my son. I mean that that crowd, and still to this day, that crowd is a rabid. So I mean, yeah, we just you know we were just playing two weeks ago, eighty thousand people, hundred thousand people, you know, intimate eighteen thousand people. Um, I, I again, I think it it was a bit difficult for my my dad to see my success when success um, eluded him. Really, you oh, don't yeah. think as a well then that that, that, that you're bringing up <clears throat> something. I'm not telling you to lie down on the couch, but I will tell you as a father. I'm sitting here with my daughter. I want more for Absolutely. my children than I have, and I agree with you. Nothing, you know, pleases me more than seeing my children. Um, exceed what I've done in certain areas. And uh, yeah, I think as parents, that's what we want. Um, look, people aren't perfect. And my parents certainly weren't perfect. And, and um, I think it, it, it was tough for my dad because it, instead of looking at my successes and seeing that he was a part of it, I think my, my dad saw it as uh, a reflection of his inadequacies. Wow. Boy, we're getting deep here. Aren't we? No, but I'm into, you know, <laughs> mental health is my whole uh, platform, but I didn't think that we were going to get that. What about your kids? Are they, anybody interested in music? Um, no. Um, I think, well, my oldest, yeah, he's he went to NYU to Tisch and graduated magna cum laude. So um, In music? Yes. I mean, it's, it's amazing because, again, the only way I, I could ever have gotten into a college was through the window. You know, so so um, what does he want to do? What is he, he doing? He does music, and he makes. You know, I don't give him any money. I, I, uh, up until the time he went to school, he was uh, delivering for a deli. So you know, I I want my kids to not have that sense of entitlement. 
<clears throat> what what is what kind of music is he doing? Um, very modern, although you know, very contemporary. Although he started off as an amazing blues guitar player. He's a really good guitar player. He's, he's a wonderful, and he's he's a spectacular guy. You know? yeah. What's his name? His name's Evan. Okay, and is that his <clears throat> stage name too, <clears throat> Evan Stanley? Yeah, that's uh, okay. That's so what, I'm telling listeners, go yeah, and they can download. Actually, can you stream his stuff? Yes, now? and he's also uh, he's out uh, doing shows now. So he he's playing in Los Angeles, and uh, you know it's it's. I'd like to see that work ethic manifested in all my kids. Uh, you know, if anything, I want to lead by example. You know, your kids aren't really taken with what you tell them, but they're more taken with what they see. So I think my my kids have seen that I've worked hard. I wrote a book more for them than for me so that, you know, I, I was in a position where my kids could, could know my story and, um, you know, know that it didn't, nothing was handed to me. I worked hard and, uh, I think it's reflected in them. My, my, um, my 16, he's, he'll be 16 next month. Colin is in Florida right now in a basketball camp um he works out twice a day on his own has nothing to do with being pushed he shoots baskets all day he's also a, a uh, great student and uh does, like, he, is, is, does he aspire to be professional in yeah. basketball yeah and i yeah i'm not one of those people who believes that well you know anything is possible if you work hard what's possible is what's possible for you if you work hard, you can achieve it. So um, for me, it's always been do a hard assessment of yourself, of what you're good at and what you are capable of. And then the hard work can pay off. If I had decided to become a mathematician, I'd be homeless. I had, <laughs> I had no ability in math. So wait, you know, that's funny that you should say that because there is a core and you would know that my daughter's a teacher there. The, I've heard that there is a correlation between math and music. Have, well, you, have you not heard that? Well, I am I am the exception to that rule. <laughs> but there is something to, have you not heard that? Am I no. alone on this? No. Am I, I did, alone on this? No, I, I, I've heard the same. And if they're talking about addition and subtraction, then yes. But it, you get past there and, and uh, I'm in trouble. So you've said you don't give your kids money. They're financially independent. But do you ever open doors for them, make connections for them? <sighs> I, I've done that, but yeah. I, I, I don't have an issue with that because to me, I can open a door mm -hmm. perhaps, but that door can get slammed also. I can open that door, but then you're on your own. Um, so have I, have I said, you know, would you um, check out my son or whatever? Yeah, but um, they can slam the door. Wow. With the reason I went, oh, is because it hurts when they edit out of the podcast. I feel a little tinge. I'm not going to tell you exactly where it affects me, but I was just sitting with my daughter and Paul Stanley in the middle of a podcast, and then he just cut into an ad read, and whew, it hurt. Anyway, it's an ad read for our sponsor on today's episode. Guess who they are? They are Surfshark. Surfshark is the sponsor. Who is Surfshark? Think protection. I'm always thinking protection. I'm wearing a condom right now. Not for the same thing Surfshark does. Surfshark is digital protection. And that is, like when you're not listening to this podcast or watching it, I'm sure you do other things online. If you're like me, you, you click on stuff, right? And sometimes you don't wanna share that with other people. You don't want people to know what you're doing online. And not only that, they could take the lists of things that you click on and they could sell those lists. You don't want people making money from what you're doing online, said a guy with a podcast reading an ad. That was irony. But the point is, we all need protection, and what an, there is no easier way than Surfshark. It is so easy to employ. And not only that, if you are listening or you are a watcher, all you have to do is Tell them that you listen to Howie Mandel and you will get a Surfshark risk-free 30-day money-back guarantee. How, all you have to do to get the Surfshark uh, VPN at surfshark.deals slash Howie. 
all in caps, H-O-W-I-E. Enter promo code HOWIE, all caps, H-O-W-I-E, for 83% off and three extra months free. That's surfshark.deals slash Howie. Is there any way to edit me back into the podcast? Um, back to Kiss for a minute. So in the book you alluded to also that you wrote in the book, part of the book, you talked about um, some of your bandmates kind of uh, maybe being anti-Semitic. Mm. How, did, how was that taken? <clears throat> Has that been resolved? Is that the... It, that that's a touchy subject. Um, you wrote it. <laughs> yes, I did. I did. For I did. all of us. Well, I I felt, you know, my book was not about throwing anybody under the bus. They walked under it. You know, I didn't push them. All right. But, um, yeah, you, I, there certainly was anti-Semitism. And I think it's, I don't want to say rampant, but, you know, they're... We, and in the world, I will tell yes. you, as a, as a fellow Jew, yes, it is rampant. But I'm also not, um, uh, at least, uh, I don't think I'm working with anybody where it is um, affecting me. So the, uh, to be in a group, I've never been in a group. I'm a comic. I work mm -hmm. by myself and I work with my family. But to be in a group where you feel that and you kind of announce that. Well, I let, let's kind of clarify i i kind of announced that decades after um when it was happening it, it, look it, it's it's a it can be an awkward situation but being jewish isn't always easy anyway you know um i remember when i first made enough money to to get an apartment in new york city and i wanted to live on fifth avenue because i wanted to overlook the park and I had a real estate agent take me. And after looking at an apartment or two, she said, look, I can take you where you want to live or when or where they'll let you live. I was like, hmm? In New York? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I was like, what are you talking about? Well, your new money and you're Jewish. So... That was a, a, a reality check. And, and um, so yeah, I think, weird in our generation that oh, we still experience that. I, I think everybody, boy, people like a scapegoat. And I think that um, Jews have historically found a way to land on their feet in the worst adversity. I agree with you. And I think that some people have a hard hard time with that how did your how did the people that you talked about a decade after it happened did mm. they reach out to you after the after the book came out no i'm no 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 um some some deny it and that's fine you know um we all have our own you know uh memories and we'll interpret events in our lives the way we choose to you also are an, an accomplished uh, artist, mm. painter, mm -hmm. and uh, and you and you're very very successful. Yes, in paint, you're a rock star in the paint world, in the in the art world. Do, do you love that as much as music? It's it's such a passion, and I'm I'm so fortunate because I came to it later in life. When did you start painting? I started painting uh, about twenty two years ago. That's it. Yeah, and in a very difficult and tumultuous time in my life. And uh, my best friend said to me, you should paint. I, I was kind of, really? And he gave me a book of Mark Rothko. And um, something resonated with me. I went out and bought paints and bought canvases and had no idea what I was going to do and started painting. And at that point, it was more cathartic. It was almost more like purging, um, not knowing what I was going to do, but just kind of uh, an emotional outlet. I never, never, ever painted with the idea of anybody seeing it, let alone um, acquiring it. And uh, at some point, um, I had a few pieces hanging in my house, and invariably people would say, who did that? Who, who did that? And I didn't sign them um, because I, I felt, well, that will, um, I guess, uh, negate whatever um, validity 
it has because who am I? I'm just some schmo painting, you know, drawing paint at a, a canvas. So <clears throat> ultimately, somebody said to me, why don't we do a show? And we just did a gallery show in Hawaii. And um, I was surprised that people bought my art. And Unsigned art? No, then then you signed. <clears throat> then you then signed. I was signing. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, and that was the start. Um, I was painting yesterday. It, How long <clears throat> after you started painting, twenty-two years ago, did <clears throat> you sell your first piece? Uh, about four years, three years later. And uh, how often? You said you're painting yesterday. You paint every day. When I'm home, I it, it's it's a uh, I don't want to say an obsession, but it's it's something that that feels really 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 good. It's it's uh, something that allows me to free myself in another direction. I'm always looking for ways to be creative because I think we can define ourselves by what we do outside of uh, you know what what we choose to do initially. So whether it was doing Phantom of the Opera or painting or you know being a, trying to be a great dad. All those things make up who who I am. You take commissions, or you just whatever. I'm not. I I do. If, I I did commissions at one point, but honestly, in some ways, that's contradictory and, and contrary to why I started painting. I started painting to the same reason I I got involved in music. I didn't want to be told what to do, so I did some commissions. I'll still do a few, but really. I do this for myself and and for money now. Well, that's that came along, but I didn't do it for money. What's the most expensive piece you've sold? My, most of my larger pieces are around sixty thousand dollars. Wow! Yeah. How many pieces do you do a year? I'm being very Jewy. I'm trying to do some yeah. math and yeah, multiplication. Do the math. <laughs> um, I've I've sold over twenty million dollars in art. Wow! Wow! Mm. And I think I asked you before we sat down, are you, are you getting into NFTs at all? Is somebody I haven't, I haven't, but um, I'm, I'm usually a little late jumping into the water. Has KISS been involved in no, NFTs? No, no. We've, we've just been kind of sitting on the sidelines, um, watching other people dip their, their toes in the water. But because you are the kings of brand. We are the most merchandise band in history. And I, Is that true? Yeah, I say that proudly. Um, yeah, it's um, it, there were bands who, who more perhaps, than the Beatles. Yes, that makes sense. That makes sense to me, because if you're buying merchandise and even like the Halloween costumes that I would see, everything you would buy the wigs, the makeup, the shoes, the I saw more Kiss merchandise growing up and even now than I ever saw of the Beatles. Wow, and that's no, believe me, the Beatles live in rarefied air, so. There's no comparison, you know, in terms of what the Beatles have accomplished. But um, yeah, we've we've uh, we maximized and have always tried to maximize our connection to our audience. I think some bands look. You couldn't do that with. I'm not going to name bands because they're please do they're boring. You know, as as far as who's the most boring band in your mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> How are you you're trying to lead me down a, a path that I, I want regret. Some, I just want some clickbait. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You already got it. I know. Um But that's why you're still selling out these this 18, is amazing. 20, he just came in from Australia. He was uh, he's I'm just going a, to Australia you, um this coming week. I just came back from Europe. And, and how big are the audiences? There was hundred thousand, there was eighty thousand, and then prior to that we were home for about two weeks, and before that, we were in South America doing the same thing, doing stadiums and. How long and has Kiss been a uh, band? Almost nineteen seventy, right? Or nineteen seventy three? So almost almost fifty years. That's crazy because I'd imagine ticket ticket sales nowadays are way harder than ticket sales when you first started for like newer bands, newer groups, newer people. I don't hear those kind of numbers at all from anyone. Well, you know the the interesting part of this is that. A lot of the the newer talent that comes along, many of them came along with instant success. Look, AGT is wonderful, Idol is wonderful, but 
you can't go from those shows to filling an arena or a stadium because people don't expect you to be able to entertain a crowd of that size. When we started out, like when you started out, I'm sure you start at the bottom, you learn your craft and you work your way up to being a headliner. Well, if you're not given that opportunity and you're just thrown into the deep end of the pool, you're going to have a hard time swimming. But the amazing thing about what you guys are doing now is now, yeah. in 2022, you're looking out at 80,000 people after 50 years. And how, how many people have lasted that long? Well, I think part of the beauty of it for me is that we're not playing to a, a blue-haired audience. You know, In other words, we're playing to multi-generations and primarily um i would say mid 20s to 30s and uh and younger you see it's kind of like lion king people are holding up their kids um you have a a, a 6 year old with his father and his father and they all want to experience that magic that they that they saw and that affected them in such a, a profound way so is Kiss writing a lot of new music? No. Why? Um, because it can. Ne at this point, I, I came to the the conclusion that it can never compete with the past. Not because it's not as good, but it hasn't the connection to um, important times in your life. Um, it doesn't have that patina to it. Of gee, I heard this. I remember I heard this song when I was. 18 or I, I heard this song when I was on my first date or whatever. Um, you can't compete with that. The, it's more than a song. It's a snapshot of your life at a certain point. But your life is still happening. Yes. But, you know, look, I, I on we did two albums in the last, I think, probably 10 years. And there are songs on those that are every bit as good as anything I've ever written. But they're new. So... Somebody says, why don't you do a new album? You do a new album, you do a song. We had <clears throat> one song, um, Modern Day Delilah, which is a, as good as any, as good as Love Gun or any, any of these songs, but it hasn't aged. It's not, it's not like wine that has a chance to, to have grow in importance, not just because of what it is, but because what it's surrounded by. But that can still happen. It's well, out there. <clears throat> somebody can sample it. You know, somebody can use right. it or it so, can play in a movie. Yes, you know? and that's great. But as far as, I think it builds in for me, a, um, it's setting myself up for disappointment. Not crushing disappointment, but when you put your heart and soul into doing something and it kind of gets a polite nod I, I, there's other things I'd rather do. And do you find joy in creating new music anymore? It sounds like you're looking towards doing stuff that creates joy for you, whether it be the art, whether it be <clears throat> the Phantom of the Opera. <clears throat> Is that something that you enjoy doing? It's totally about, at this point, it's about what makes me happy. Yeah. And that should be everybody's mantra. Um, Doc, my, Doc McGee, uh, my manager and, and good friend, he coined a phrase that, for me, only becomes more important. QTR, quality time remaining. Wow. And that, that's what life's about, you know? Look, at one point in my life, I always saw life as kind of like a, um, a moving sidewalk, you know? And everybody was in front of me. Well, now I look and everybody's behind me. So it's like, what are you going to do with your time? What are you going to do that matters to you and the people around you. So, do you uh, enjoy being on stage? I love being on in stage in front of 80,000 people. That's where I live. So, why has Kiss announced a farewell tour? Because physically, we can't continue to do it indefinitely. Look, if I was on stage like this, I yeah, I'll do it into my 80s, 90s, but I'm carrying around 40, 50 pounds of gear and running around on stage for two and a half hours, making it look easy. And 
you know, at some point you have to go, I'm not going to be able to do this. So it's really... A, Are you a, in pain? I've had enough surgeries. You've had hip replacements, right? I had a hip replacement. I've had... And I, again, look, everything comes with a price, and I'm perfectly happy with what I've paid. I've had both my knees operated on. I've had rotator cuffs on both shoulders uh, repaired. I popped a bicep tendon. I've had a hip replacement. You know... How do you uh, get it in? And you think it's because of the performances? Oh, totally. No, there's no... Look, I just turned 70. Wow. There's no basketball players there's no football players there's no athletes forget about 70 50 you know um 45 so yeah so it's, it's um all my all my close doctor friends yeah it's 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 part of what i do and wow. and i'm i'm blessed to be able to to have will it be incredibly depressing for you when it's too painful to get up on stage i i won't be at that point ever um it'll be finished before before then um i don't want to see that kind of situation and i don't want the audience to see that kind of situation that's that's I know who, one of the most depressing things i just saw and i'm not knocking or putting him down in any way but phil collins last tour did you see that he's in a i saw videos that was really hard to watch as a fan but my point of view on that is whether it's an athlete or a performer, they have the right to continue oh, doing I'm not, what makes them happy. Right. And you have the right to not go. Right. But people who go, gee, I wish he wouldn't be up there doing that because I want to remember him. The way. Well, don't go. You know? Right. They've already fulfilled not only what mattered to them, but you're giving you so much joy the idea that well now it was just empathy it wasn't like he ruined something for me i just felt bad as another human being watching somebody and maybe putting myself wrongly into his mind going like he loved drumming and he loved performing he's still singing and his voice is great but he could barely move and he looked it looked so painful and i just felt bad not cheated he may feel grateful for what he can still do Glass half full, buddy. Totally. <laughs> you hey, guys to, are the opposite. <laughs> to me, the glass is always overflowing. You know, I'm half empty, half full. No. We're, every day is a miracle. Are you happy? So happy. Really? Yeah, really, really happy. Um, and wasn't always. But, you know, when you reach that point, if you reach that point, it's it's wonderful. It Do doesn't. you have any regrets? None. 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 Um. Are you I, we okay go ahead. I wanted to go back to something really fast because I'm so fascinated by the music industry as a whole in comparison to what it was mm. when you first started and what it is now. You especially since you have a child that's mm -hmm. in the industry, you mentioned that people now are just thrown into stardom mm -hmm. and you had to work your way up to it. Isn't that everyone now the record labels don't work oh, on it's, groups it's, or people. It's completely different now. I would hate to be starting now. I'm so thankful that I'm at this point in my career because, um, look, there are people who are being very creative and saying money doesn't matter to me. Well, it'll matter when you don't have money for the rent. So I remember somebody saying to me, I just want to be happy. I don't need money. I said, well, that's good until you need money. So nowadays it's a very different world. Um, the record companies used to nurture artists they would sign you and you'd have three albums where they would kind of coax you and help you to achieve you know what your your potential was nowadays you know it's all about bean counters and and bottom lines and if the algorithms or whatever they're looking at don't work for that one song you put out see ya so you never knocked heads with the the label I've heard I have friends with other artists who've you know released a song or uh, recorded a song and then the label goes ah, go back in I don't like that and you always hear stories about the record label saying no this is not the single this mm. is not the single and then it turns out that that single is what did you have that I you know I may not have always been the easiest person to get along with and um, I I'm again. I've never been great at being told what to do. 
and I, I don't, that doesn't sit well with me, particularly at this point, because you know uh, there's enough people at record companies who were in kindergarten, you know, when when I had my first platinum album. So, and uh, I I do remember at one point um, we had a song called Forever, which was a big big hit, and I remember going into the head of A and R at uh, uh, the record label, and he was telling me, "Well, you, you need to go back in and change the ending. You know, um, it should fade out on the chorus and this and that." And I'm looking at this guy like schmuck. I, I was doing this when you were in grade school, you know. Um, and you well, were right. It became yes, <laughs> and. You know, look, I can be wrong too, but I'd rather be wrong of my own volition. And now a word from our sponsor. Well, it's a word from me, Howie, talking about our sponsor. I need help. I always need help. I've been very open about my mental health issues. And with what the world's been going through in the last couple of years, I would imagine there are a lot of people like me out there who need help. You don't have to be diagnosed with anything. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure out there. And who do you turn to? Better help. That's better help, H-E-L-P. They're there for you and they help. Um, you just need to take care of yourself. I think the first move to getting help is to talk about it. And sometimes we don't have anybody that we can talk to about it, but better help is always there. Um, and I'll tell you something, just talking about it and reaching out and having that kind of help, makes life so much better for me, and I know it would make it that much better for you. So our listeners will get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash Howie, H-O-W-I-E. You get a deal. I love saying that word, deal. Write that down. Maybe we can make a game out of it. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Howie. H-O-W-I-E. Glad I could be of some help. Now back to the show. The dynamics of being in a group. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you and Gene like 50-50? Yes. Do, do you, but you don't always agree. No, no. And, and um, Gene's my brother. I've, I've been with, with Gene. We both lived at home when we, when we started this. Now we're older. Um, we have families. We, we have the joy of seeing each other's you know, lives and what we've done. So um, do we always agree? Earlier on, we agreed less, but we were always about, let's do what's best for the band. It was never about trying to have your way because it's your way. But being in a group is hard, isn't it? It's a, it's like, it's, it's it, it, it is probably difficult. even harder than marriage because well, it's four way or five way. And um, yeah, it's, and you've gotten together with somebody, not because of your personalities, but because of what you are trying to achieve musically. So yeah, it's, it's, it can be real difficult. And, and oftentimes uh, you have to get a divorce from some of those people. Well, that's what I was gonna ask you again. So the, the original Kiss mm -hmm. band is, mm -hmm. you guys are the only two original, yes. right? So how does that work? Do you, um, when you first started, were you all equal partners? Yes. And then who makes the decision that they're going to leave? Was anybody pushed out or did they make a decision to leave? Um, there were both. And um, democracy is overrated in some, some fields. You know, the, the idea of everybody being equal um, in theory is a lovely thing. But if some people are doing more work, well... Those people should be compensated if the people if everybody isn't putting in a hundred percent effort, then you shouldn't be getting an equal share. Nobody is saying that everybody can contribute uh, equally, but you should do your best. So were the breakups or the leaving uh, money uh, was money no, the no ego, drugs, alcohol, um, personality. You know, did you ever have a drug problem? No, no, no. I, uh, I saw people doing drugs and dying. I had 
you know, people around me who literally died um, even before the band got together. Um, I remember being a kid and seeing Billie Holiday die. You know, you saw all these people and... Wait, you you weren't in the room. <laughs> no. no, I was not in the room. Um, but the idea of people dying who were performers, well, it, it always seemed pretty synonymous with drugs or alcohol. Right. And I went, well, okay, let me, let, me, let me get this right. If I take this, I'm going to become impotent. I am going to become unproductive. My social life, you run down this thing, then but, go. But you had the wherewithal when you were that young to be able to have that kind of restraint. When it, wasn't it rampant all totally. around? Totally. Yeah. It but, was, and that's what I'm thinking. Like to be, you were in your 20s when yes. you were at that. I'm saying yes. the height. The height yeah, is still yeah. here. You're still paying 80, yeah. 80, uh, you know, 80,000 people. But you're in your 20s. Every hot woman is trying to get backstage. And, and they got backstage. No, I know. So, and they got, so, the, the, and then the, the, just the, how do you say no to anything? I would say that um, drugs and sex were the currency for um, any kind of interactions with the band. Right. You know, people would talk about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Right. And I said, you keep the drugs. You know, I, I had no interest in, in that. The, the other parts were, were terrific. Um, but drugs, I, I saw them destroy people. And I, I think even to this day, there are people who've just become a caricature, a cartoon, you know, of, of rock stars. How many people have sleeves of tattoos now that look like gangrene because, <laughs> you know, once upon a time they were beautifully detailed. Now it just looks like a, a war wound. So, um, yeah, I've always been pretty pragmatic, whether it was um, life choices. Even, look, when I met Gene, I didn't like Gene. But I also realized that this wasn't about that. It was about I was better with him than without him. You met him through a friend, a mutual yes. friend? Yes, and uh, um, I, didn't, I, I didn't like him. Why? What was um, your, tell me about your first meeting. He was, um, I came to my friend's apartment and he said, Stan, meet Gene. You know, and he said, Gene, Stan writes songs too. And Gene said, oh yeah, play me one. <laughs> I was like, okay. And I, I played him one of my songs. And I think that was surprising to him because he thought Lennon and, and McCartney and Gene were like the only three people writing songs. <laughs> um, and he played a song for me, which... Um, <clears throat> is long forgotten, but my song wound up on our first album. So, um, he has a big ego, he I does. Mean, but it's also, it's kind of enjoyable. I think he leans into it. Yes. He, he plays it for all it's worth, but Gene's a, Gene Smart at, man. at heart is a good, good person who is, um, does more charity work than he lets people know. And you know, he's, um, again, he's my brother. It, that's different than you know saying oh somebody's your best friend he's not my best friend we don't commiserate and we don't spend a lot of time together but um he's always there he would always be there for me you don't spend you don't socialize when you're not on the road no no How about when you are on the road though are yeah. you yeah we, we it's fun to to go out but again we're we're different people and we want different things um when you when you were first starting out and and well, not first starting out when Kiss like blew up and you were before you uh, took off the makeup, mm. um, you said you, you had a, a I saw a glow when I started talking about the ladies and they all wanted to come backstage. Was it's there, there? It's there again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the thing is that you would take off the makeup. You, you were very secretive about who you were. Were you not? Like, um, it, did, did you ever find yourself in an uncomfortable position? Going, no, no, I'm the guy. No, but I did hear about women who were with guys who claimed they were me. You know, <laughs> I said, I hope they did me proud. Yes. You know, yeah, I would do that if I was, <laughs> I was not single at the time, but that would be a great idea just to put a little bit of like yeah. a smudge of makeup a smudge on my of makeup. And yeah. And go, oh, did I not get it? Yeah. Did I not get it all off? When you, you had the long curly hair. Yeah. yeah. I, had, I had long curly hair. <laughs> I had hair. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
was was that a big discussion to uh what was the discussion in in taking off the i thought that was brilliant the secrecy i remember seeing you on tom snyder and yeah um you know the the taking off the of the makeup some people will say it was brilliant it really came down to we didn't have any choice our our the band was was waning at best i mean our sales were way way down and we put out a great album with the makeup on and it was clear to me that people were listening with their eyes and also we had changed two members and came up with new makeup it became that to me was disingenuous i think that having Tommy and Eric, who've been in the band over 20 years, Eric's been in, in and out of the band um, over 25 years, having them wear the original makeup is more genuine to me than com coming up with new characters. You know, what do you want, Turtle Boy? You know, <laughs> Snail Man? <laughs> you know, so... Um, um, but to take it off. You yeah, made it. but so to you take thought, it off. So that was like a for lack of a better term, a gimmick to spark new sales in the sense it, that we're going to see mm, them for the first time in their flesh. It really wasn't. You know, we, we get a lot of credit for being a lot brighter than we are. It really was a, a move to try to survive. Um, if we couldn't survive without the makeup, we didn't deserve to survive. I mean, so was, was there ever a moment when after the makeup was off where you go shit i wish i would have just kept it on a little bit longer there's no getting around that nothing could compete with us in makeup us taking off the makeup and being on stage like a lot of other bands you know i i'm the first to say it pales next to it but it was necessary and you know, in retrospect, it allowed us to go back to it at some point. So, and and you guys did you design? Did you design it yourself? Each person designed their own makeup. Yeah, but it, there's a there's some sort of you know symbiotic synchronicity or whatever when you're all in a room together doing something. So, um, yeah, everybody came up with with theirs. And why are you Star Child? Um, I liked. Here we go again. Look, I was an unpopular kid. I was a chubby, unpopular kid with a birth defect who wanted to be a star, wanted to be sought after, wanted to be popular. I wasn't popular. Um, so I created a character that ultimately I became, but I initially created something that I wasn't. Wow. Did you have you had the opportunity? I'm sure you have had the opportunity to bump into some of the people that were maybe the hardest on you as a child and go, oh, um, my God. You remember who Paul Stanley was? I'm sure people come up to you and they're like, we went to school. We were best friends. And you're like, mm. um, <laughs> you know, I really believe that if if you have bitterness or you seek revenge, it means that you're not living a. I don't think seeking it. I just think, you know, it's really funny. As the, 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 my personal relatability to the story that you're telling is, you know, I was diagnosed later in life with OCD and uh, whatever issues. And so I great had. that you have it out in public. Right. And removing the stigma. Because people need to know that the people that we respond to, um, respect, or aspire to be aren't perfect. No, I'm far from perfect. And I was, a, I was a, an outcast at school. And I, was, I didn't have a friend in the world. And I did things in school that are somewhat memorable. And I've told those stories before. But as my daughter pointed out, I can't tell you how many times people have walked up to me and, and uh, said, you know, I was in your class. You were so funny. Well, nobody in my class laughed. Nobody was my friend. The best I got was an eye roll or you're so immature or you're disgusting, you know, but, and, but their memory has kind of changed. So yes. I'm wondering, you've, you went through kind of the same thing. So you were this, this kid that obviously had a history with some other people and you rewrote your future and you rewrote history. And I'm wondering if any of those people, even not that you're looking for it, that came up and go, I can't believe Paul. You were such you were this nerdy kid that I was hard on and I'm just so I'm just such a big Kiss fan. You're just so wonderful. It's so neat to did that happen? 
um, in my dream it did i can i can say that i i've had people come to me and say you were voted the least likely to succeed <laughs> you know <laughs> Um, and I, I, I've had a few people say, gee, you know, you know, I read your book and that's so surprising because you were such a nice kid and we, we, you know, everyone, you know, liked you. And it's like, you know, it's, it's, uh, we, we rewrite history to, well, I want to say something to you. You know, I've met you throughout the years. I probably against your will was singing back up on one of your songs, which probably <laughs> that track never made it into the album. And you've been a wonderful proponent at AGT. You You're probably your their version of Yoko. You're their Yoko. Your kiss is Yoko. You came into the studio when no one wanted you. They didn't break up. I'm just saying like it, you were the annoyance. You were the annoyance of the group. <laughs> Let it be. Okay. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> See what I did there? Yes. So, but Today is the first time I've ever really got a chance to really sit down and talk to you. And I can't tell you how impressed I am. I've always been impressed. You know, I asked him to come in and do the podcast and his priorities in order. I asked him to come in yesterday. It was his daughter's birthday. He family first, uh, priorities first. He's traveling the world. You have incredible success. You give of your time. You are, and I know with um, that the charity that you worked with in Toronto for the children that are disfigured. You've you've not only uh, you know accomplished and gone over your own hurdles, but you've helped others with their hurdles. You're a good person. You're a smart person. You're innovative, and I think you deserve all the success and more that you continue to get. When, as somebody who knows you from afar, I can't wait to see what you're doing next. Is there something that you have that you haven't explored, or you're just dabbling in now? Like it, 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 the last big one was painting, and then you became a a painter. Are you? Is there something that you have in the periphery? Not to be corny, but that's what makes life exciting. When people talk about bucket lists, I don't understand bucket lists because what do you do when you cross off everything? Every day you should find something to add to the list. So where I'm going to go next, what I'm going to do, I'm as excited because I don't know. Well, but we're even more excited because the things that you have been putting in your bucket have been really joyful things that we can all share, whether it's your art, whether it's your music, whether it's your sound, or just your philosophy and your talking and your words and your books. We really, you really are an inspiring, uh, amazing human being. Um, is there something you want to plug? Uh, the tour, they can just go to kiss.com. Yeah, the, the, the tour is great. And, and it, Where's your art shown? Um, my art is always at Wentworth Galleries, which are around the country. Um, you also gave me a pair a couple of years ago. You gave me a pair of sneakers. Are they selling the, your sneakers? My sneakers, um, I, I cut off my, my deal for, for the sneakers. No sneakers. So but let's again, all go barefoot. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to do flip-flops. But yeah, again, I just looked at shoes and went, I can do that. And I, you know, I did that. So all I can, you know, what do I want to plug? I want to plug that everybody out there has the right to explore and be everything that they can be. And, and remember that the people around you who tell you what's impossible are the ones who failed. Go out there, be an advocate for yourself. I, I have nothing more to say than that. You are an amazing man. It is Paul Stanley. It is kiss. It is art. It is humanity. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Really? That was so awesome. Yeah. You're really amazing.